Okay, welcome back after the break. I hope you all found somewhere, some place to get some food uh, and had the, the, the possibility to talk to other attendees. Um, we'll continue here with the uh, talk on uh, Metamate and the talk on Premium Cola. And remember, there are two workshops currently, um, but I think they're already booked, so here are no workshops. You have to go to the workshop area, just in case. And uh, look at the uh, exhibition area outside. Um, it's still, uh, it is really nice to see uh, these guys there. And then there is some mirror in front. Uh, I was asked to tell you if you want to taste it, go and grab one bottle. Uh, do you have an opener there? Okay, there is some kind of opener. And, okay. Hello, I'm Kritika, and this is Fabricio. Fabricio and I run Metamate together. Fabricio has a experience with international marketing, and after leaving the corporate world, then we decided to okay, work um, on our, we did some art projects together, traveled around for 10 years, and then we decided to do the Mate project together. I just want to say that um, this presentation is completely low tech. Our computer was stolen a couple of weeks ago with all of our backup, and we're really into the Mate production and the quality of our Mate, so don't judge the of our mate by this presentation. Yeah, talk, talking about the mate. Yeah, then. The mate originally comes from South Brazil, from tribes called Guarani, and they call it ka. What one knows from mate is the cup. That's why one would even drink mate coca, for instance. That's the mate. And they call ka for the herb. And it's really in some tribes where they do not have the concept of property. They do share the material goods and they share around the fire, as you see in this picture, where they also share the material. The knowledge is also shared around this fire where the mate circulates. So it's a kind of instrument. and in Spanish, the yerba mate. In the globalized world, one of the few products that just grow in that area where it originally comes from. It didn't migrate to other countries, so up to today you can only buy mate coming from that area there in blue. Originally, it was used by the indigenous people from their own consume. They were producing two, two and a half kilograms, very small from the forest. It changed in the 70s with a program from the dictature government in Brazil called Big Brazil. And the post was a truck going over a tree for this program and say transforming unuseful land in useful land. So were they burning the forest to create a monoculture, special for grains like soya. That is the uh, two pictures of a mate plantation. Take care of the size of those trees, like cutting like the bone size. That's how the, all the mate that's available in the market in Europe comes from, all from monocultures. And it's a pity because it could have been made that it could harvest from the forest and have a more sustain, sustainable uh, relationship to the forest. And um, that brings us yet now to mate in Germany. I mean, what everyone knows as mate in Germany, the most popular thing at the moment is club mate. Um, and these cold mate limo drinks are something that um, is, a there's a lot about it written in this book, Hacker Browse, that also talks a lot about like the more open source drinks. The premium collective and premium cola, which Uwe will speak about later, has been a big inspiration for most of the drinks that have come out on the market, like Flora Power or Leet Mate, and also they've helped us a lot with Mir. Um, you can try all these drinks, by the way, in the cafe. Um, in 2010, when we came to Germany, we were ready to um, introduce Berlin to a new type of mate, a fresh forest harvested mate that we called Meta Mate. And we spent some years in Brazil where we went to the forests and really found the old trees that grew in the forest, spoke with the, in, the people there about the ancient methods of producing mate to kind of get the authentic mate 
tomato that's smoked on fire with the big proper leaves, um, not the monocultures. And we collected several samples and also brought them back to Germany, different samples of mates produced in different ways and entered into a partnership with the Boeth University here in Berlin to study different mates and kind of see what properties they had and what differentiated industrial mate from non-industrial mate. We also did um, different tests to see how the different mate drinks on the market were accepted by people and also what they thought of the different mates that were on the market and that were available. Um, one of the most important aspects of mate that most people find is the caffeine content in it. And this is what we researched as well to see which mate kind of has the highest amount of caffeine. Just one hint here, the three right blue bulks, they are from reference values that's not mate. And the green ones are the our wild handmade and the blue ones are the monoculture one. And what we did find was that um, our mate that was made with 100% big leaves did have a higher caffeine content than all of the other mates. Um, along with that, we researched the antioxidant levels in different mates to see what, which ones had higher ones. I mean, the antioxidants in mate is the kind of the healthy aspect of it, which most people aren't always so concerned about. But anyway, what we did find out was that once again, the mate made from the old trees with the really big leaves had the highest values um, with this. We're also planning on doing a few other um, studies with the university to get reforestation done um, in conjunction with our mate. If you see, most of the whole original mate um, growth has just been cut down. And this here, in this area here, we are closer now with a project with the Eberswalde Nachhaltig University in Germany. To, we are cloning some species of mate, reproducing it, and planting it in an area together with a forest. And this will be an open project that we transfer for the other small farmers, so they can also cultivate their rest of forest and produce the mate in a higher quality then. In the meantime, we also wanted to check kind of the negative aspects of mate, or many people kind of asked us this question, well, what about the carcinogenic aspects? Mate drinking has been linked to cancer, and no one is really quite sure about where the, this arises from. The only thing is that we know is the benzopyrene is the only five levels, five ring of the substance inside that is high carcinogenic. <laughs> And we tried to research it in Brazil and in Germany, and we could not, in different universities, we found one student that was really like, uh, wanted to do it. And she came with us to Brazil, she harvested mate together with us, and she brought all of these samples then back to Berlin, where, as Fabrizio mentioned, none of the universities could analyze this, and so we did a crowdfunding project together with her to raise money so that this could be researched at a private lab. Yeah, and it was also an idea for another person from the premium collective who said, make it and ask all the companies to do it. So we did wrote to some big mate companies that are in Germany and also to the small ones, help us to research because we are selling mate, we should know if there is something that causes cancer there. And astonished, one customer from Russia wrote to 30 companies. He took the care to write 30 emails and forward to us asking for help on it. We forward on it. And none of them responded to us. However, we got 50% of our support from the Premium Collective as well, who there were many people there who were also just concerned about finding the truth out. We can say it. the Flora Power, Premium Call itself, uh, and other people wanted to create a new mats on the market. They want to sponsor to see exactly if there is something that causes cancer or not. And we're hoping to get the results by end of January. and. This should also help us in determining the best way to produce mate in the future so that we can produce mate with the least amount of carcinogens in it, whether it's certain types of plants or whether it's the processing techniques. So we're looking into this. And I think it's a kind of our philosophy also of transparency. If you're selling something, to know also the negative part and to advertise in it, to show outside what are the pros and the cons in the product and not only the positive selling approach. And um, the, I mean, what we're doing now is we're, we're taking all of this research and we want to use it for creating another mate drink that's then a lot more natural and using the correct mate with the correct processing techniques and 
Yeah, we're still going through tests with and this. And we, we have it the receptor to test there in the bar in the Shila Cafe outside. You can try this new limonade. One interesting aspect that we have uh, in the mirror bottles is this fair trust. Why we created that? We try to certify our mate as bio. There is no regulation for a wild mate as bio. For being bio mate, you have to be a monoculture. So we could not be bio. We tried to make fair trust. It fair was trade. Uh, fair trade. It was asked us which water you use in the plantation. We said no water. What do you do with the rest of the water? No way, there is no rest. What kind of uh, fertilizer you use? No fertilizer is wild. And so pesticides, there's no pesticides. So everything okay, yeah, but which is your cooperative? So no cooperative, we do it ourselves. And so that kills the idea because if you do yourself, you cannot be fair trade. And a lot of people, I think, on the market today really want these kind of stamps on their stuff. You should be bio, you should be fair trade in order to be good. And we said, okay, then we create fair trust. And we say that, you know, if you have any questions, you can look on the internet. If you don't find it on the internet, then ask us from everything from recipes to origins to finances, we're willing to share this. And all our, the bigger project, the Mir will talk soon, the, all the finance are there in pads. Everything, all the costs, everything is everything transparent on the internet. So um, the, the main thing is that we're trying to get the mate message out over here, and not everyone really wants to just drink a mate tea, and so we started to blend our mate with other products, um, from the kuyas the, that we're making, these ceramic things, to mate chocolates. Um. Let's say the mate chocolate comes from Belgium, then chocolate was Belgian with uh, raw with mate, then we did the... German. Mate absinthe also, then we did um, mate cosmetics and lots of other different you, you things. You can try the mate uh, mere bread outside also in the cafe. Yeah. And of course the main kicker, the main thing that we did with mate was mere. Yeah, that happened in December uh, last year, still not one year old, the project. We were drinking in a place called the Pirate Cave that's more like a underground illegal meeting point for pirates and we were drinking lots of mat and lots of beer, and we said we should do it together as a joke, and someone said, uh, let's call it Mir. And we did that then for a pirate meeting in February. We did 500 bottles of it, and the idea also, we created then a liquid democratic approach, where in each single bottle, we put a different QR code with the entrance to a liquid democratic platform. By that, we solved one of the main problems in liquid democracy is that you keep anonymous, but still have the safety that per each person has only one vote. That's a big issue inside of the Pirate Party, how to solve it. So we did each single bottle has a single PDF made, a single label. So every person who got one bottle could scan it and get it then in this platform where they choose the content of the bottle. So that we could adjust then the content to the next brew, and that's the way we start and keep going on, always local and always adjusting the taste. One funny thing is that we left the queries open so people could put in new questions, and... Sorry. <laughs> so, like this, in this platform, someone asked there, we should nationalize all banks. Or there was the question, should we remove the German troops from Afghanistan? So in this playful way, we started to ask liquid democracy for a beer, and people start to put their own questions and vote on it there. Oh, well, then a, a little bit short in the story from Emir, we started to see that people want different things. So we started to produce different tastes, but we were very small, so we went uh, sour, went bad, some of them. So we approached the people by the Biennale Occupy movement, and we put lots of Emir there for free to drink. And also an interesting approach, the people have to label themselves, make it a DIY there, choose it. But the people from Occupy and the people who had no money could drink for free. The people who had more money had to pay three or 50. And this way we sponsored that the old people who didn't have money could drink there. And this approach that I mentioned also goes further to Mir here. We have, a, as a Creative Commons license, this Mir is done in Belgium, it's more industrial, while the craft beer done in Berlin is handmade, a much higher quality, and for that we get no margin here, but we put a higher margin industrial one by sponsored than a local small producer to have it also on the market. And that's the approach that we have. The bigger the company is, the more margin you get when we are making the negotiations. Big surprise, 
we get so much press. Mia came on the market and we were like overloaded with press and people and TV and different newspapers and from different countries. Like uh, I'm writing about it in email and people say in Peru and Argentina, we know about you, we know what you're doing. It's like we went very fast at the, the whole news. And we decided the idea to not keep this pirate thing from the beginning. Then we do like for the pirates when it's a pirate event, but we, we want to separate from politics. So we did mere uh, without the idea of the pirates then. And started to come then the first license is just coming to us, the Belgian one. Oh, this is the premium. <laughs> and it started to, uh, to be, it was brewed then in Brazil and another brewery in Brazil. And then we have uh, different labels in different places started to brew. This is the actual, the green one in Berlin. And two weeks ago in Bayer was done the first one in South Germany. And next month we'll do in Switzerland. I should remind this project is still not one year old. So it's, and we have the recipes on the internet and it is spreading kind of uh, fast. At the moment we have here for you to try the Belgian one. That's one third of the mate of the Berlin one. That's also a nice thing about Creative Commons because we are looking for a company that would produce our Berlin beer very similar in a larger scale because it's too expensive, this small one. So these people approached us and said, we want to do it. And he said, you do exactly like our recipe, please. And when that came out, it's fully white, it's one third of the mate, and we were shocked and very unpleased with the news. And after we found that many people prefer it and only drink this one. And that's kind of okay, it fits to our concept local then, let it be, and we keep looking for different breweries that will do the way they think it should be. And each bottle is, um, has a QR code in it. Like Fabrizio mentioned before, we were using this platform Liquidizer. Fortunately, we had to switch to Facebook at the moment. We're looking for a better solution. But the idea is that people can kind of comment on their mirror and you know, say which mirror tastes better, or how they would like the next mirror to be, or you know, find a place that would then brew a mirror more according to their local taste. A professor of art said something about the mirror that's kind of nice. It's exploding the uniform of the bottle by allowing adjustable content. In this way, you have this massified product that the consumer locally can choose what will be inside under the same umbrella. And for today and the next days, you have this one we did for this event where we hope you enjoy it and then put your commentaries there. If we have this event next year, we will brew a special version according to the taste of people that are attending to it then. Yeah, we're finishing less than 50 minutes and looking forward if you have some questions now, it makes it more interesting for us also. So are there questions? If not, we will continue with the next talk directly. <coughs> there is one question, sorry. Um, uh, how, so how many people work in your company now? Is it just you two? Or? Um, let's say working, are we both, and maybe we can make a parenthesis about it. We are still being happily sponsored by the German government. We get a hard sphere, so Creative Commons open source is not making us rich right now. <laughs> and we have uh, help from many friends that do different things for us, more like a network from friends that uh, we are both mate hackers. We know nothing from the web design to the servers. And last week, for instance, someone hacked our server and it was lots of pornography coming on our site. And it was really amazing. We just tweeted to a friend in less than half hour. There was two friends busy and it was gone. They just went in and cleared up everything and many things on the Metamatics running like a network of friends that give some support. Or here the Uwe, who helped many other soft drinks to come in the market. And the first time I called Uwe, I'm starting for me I don't know this drink market and he's giving this full support, like the f one example worth to say, I was doing the license for this Belgian mirror and I sent Uwe to check. And he said, yeah, very fine, the contract, but there is the word only there. I almost sold the exclusivity of the brand to a company. And it was really nice to have someone from outside to look and check on what you're doing. Hi. 
Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the harvesting process? It's not a cooperative, so are you working with local landowners or tree owners or just people who go into the woods and collect mate for themselves? Um, most of it is, I mean, Fabrizio has a childhood friend from Brazil who has like a huge piece of land from his grandfather. And so every few months he goes there and kind of goes into the forest and finds the old trees. And Fabrizio goes once a year to do it together as well. And there are a couple of people who are, you know, kind of living on the property who help out. And then when we don't have, or sometimes we go to neighbors' properties because no one really wants to deal with the forest. Like the forest is kind of unproductive land for most of the people. So no one wants to go through the forest and look for the old trees. So when we say, okay, we're gonna cut down your mate leaves and process it and give you a bit of the mate in exchange, they're all quite happy for that. And the, nice to say that the people who work and make the mate, they're all German descendants. They all speak German there. And we have their telephone and the website. And so like there's this transparent thing. And they live kind of self-sustainable. And this kind of mate wild hand processed is, let's say, illegal. You cannot do it. So there is no brand on the market, even in Brazil, selling a wild hand processed mate. Is everything going through the industry? In Argentina, 80% of the mate monoculture belongs to three families. And that's exactly the standard you want to break, create a technology, a way of having a much higher quality, with the proved by the research by the university, and spread as open source so that other farmers can do the same thing. And our project now is, a, is together with a, we are approaching the Brazilian government to make it illegal for small farmers to produce their own mate. So thank you so much for the attention. If there is no more questions, as I'm looking for. Uh. Yeah, yeah, we do the raw chocolate. It's not cooked without sugar in Belgium and another one in Berlin. We sell it here. But we are very open to new ideas. Like we have a chocolate with chili there and we do mate butter, mate popcorn, and one day we do the moin, the mate coin. And <laughs> we're kind of uh, doing a mate hacking space, really. So thank you so much. I think the one of pass for Uvi. I'm looking forward to hear it. Thank you. So thanks a lot to Fabrizio and Critica for introducing me. My name is Uwe. I make a living by hacking into business and making parts of it open source. It took me several years to get there, but now I can do it and I'm going to tell you how. My story goes like this. I was sitting in my bathtub several years ago and drinking my then favorite brand of Afrikola. And I noticed the taste was different, and the content of ke caffeine I liked so much didn't show up, so they obviously had secretly changed the recipe, which I didn't quite like. So I went to Cologne and asked the producer what had happened, and he told me he had changed the brand to a so-called Mineralbrunnen AG, which is a very big company, and they tried to rearrange the ingredients and rearrange the brand and sell lots of it and more of it. And uh, they could do so, in my opinion, but uh, one thing they shouldn't have done is to do this secretly, so to change the ingredients but not tell anybody about it. And this made me kind of angry, and it arised a kind of certain feeling like I, I couldn't have put it that way, but I didn't like the way the usual business works. This was just a, just a very vague feeling uh, back in my head. And so I funded uh, a little protest campaign, which was called Interessengruppe Premium, because the product was called Afrikola Premium before, and then Afrikola. And I put up a homepage and did press releases and so on, and tried to inform the, uh, the other users and the other customers and collect them together to pressure this big company to rechange the recipe. And this was 13 years ago, so there wasn't even Facebook back then. But we were 780 uh, people. And uh, this put up quite some pressure altogether, and I got invited to this big company, and we talked, and we mailed, and we phoned, and so on. And they even hired someone who had to deal with us, and this guy was called the crisis manager. Pretty funny still, I think, because the, the consumers kind of raised their voice and very politely asked to co-decide on the ingredients, and they viewed this as a crisis and tried to defend themselves. And after two years of dialogue, they issued Afrikola Light in a plastic bottle, without even telling us before. And this had showed me they didn't quite understand what I was up to. I had the 
certain certain idea like I'm the user I'm the customer I should be informed about the product I'm buying and I should be able to co-decide a little and they, they shouldn't be able to just change matters without informing me and this was the, the core idea and uh, then I was very lucky and got an email pointing me to the original recipe to a producer who still could brew the original Africola so I tried to order a thousand bottles and he laughed at me because a thousand bottles is a very small amount 50,000 bottles would be the, the minimum amount but he saw that we had put into so much work two years um, before so he uh, did a thousand bottles for us and I packed them to uh, cases and sent them to the people from the homepage and then they were gone I had to do another thousand bottles and another thousand and by this I accidentally had founded an own drinks company but the problem was uh, I had no idea how to actually run it and it got worse when I um, was eating some fries with a friend of mine and he put a bottle on the shelf of this local shop here and the owner Harry said oh yeah I want to sell it and so I had to regularly produce, distribute, invoice, organize a drinks production, and I had no idea. So I invited every new partner, the first trucker, the first dealer, the first gastronomy, to the Golden Poodle Club in Hamburg every Sunday evening, and tried to talk every matter uh, as long as everybody agreed, because I wanted a kind of a company who deliberately tried to care for every stakeholder as good as it can. And that's why we talked long, long, long evenings, you can guess. And uh, we did this for several years, and then matters switched. The whole idea of having a company who feels like responsible for all users and stakeholders and tries to be transparent and tries to take everybody's need into account and talk as long as everybody agrees has become a module in a certain bigger surrounding, which is called collective nowadays. And to give an idea of, about the size, we have a several 10,000 consumers right now. We will be selling 1 million bottles uh, this year. We have 680 companies somehow connected to, this, uh, to the structure. 98 people are nowadays talking still to the consensus in a mailing list, half of which are business users, half of which are uh, end users. There's six people having so-called so organizational roles, and in the end, I'm responsible for everything. But the switch was, when you really try to, to get everybody's needs into these discussions and talk as long as every, until everybody agrees, then you will come up with more clever and more sustainable and more stable decisions than anyone could do on their own. And that's what we do. And with this whole group of people, it's quite tempting to kind of secure them by making contracts. But I had this basic idea that I don't want people to be in this structure and stay there because they have to. Like now, I don't I want you to be here because you want to listen, but not because you have to. So I didn't do any single written contract in the beginning and have maintained this until now. I don't have any single written contract with this 680 um, corporate users and with end users also. And this, in my opinion, kind of sneaks into the system the basic idea I have about a company. Because if I know that you could leave any time, I have to treat you a little better than if you are bound by some contract and the other way around. So everybody knows the other, the other one could leave any moment and that's why everybody has to treat each other a little better than somewhere else. And by this, the whole structure gets a little more stable and a little more social and sustainable than the usual companies, at least in my opinion. So what we do, just to step back on the, on, the, on the meta level, is a kind of open source brand building management company running with all the end users and with all the corporate users. Because I don't take any single decision by myself, but I put everything, every development into this collective and have everything co-decided with everybody else. And this is on the one hand because I have this vague idea of a kind of better, more human company. And on the other hand, from the scientific point of view, we will combine the so-called corporate user innovation management with the so-called end user innovation management, both usually separate chapters in company management, and we combine these. And by this, we get the, uh, the corporate users who know their stuff and the end users who come up with new ideas and combine both and talk as long as everybody agrees, and then we come up with better solutions, in my opinion. Just to give an idea about this network, over the left, these are the suppliers of uh, crates and sugar and bottle and so on. 
they sell pre-products to our bottling plants and they sell the bottles to us, like in the middle of the whole structure. We sell the bottles to the wholesalers, they sell them to dealers, they sell them to gastronomies and they sell them to you as a customer. And some of them will take part in the distribution, so I want to give them a share and they need an accounting guy and a web server and they need uh, some other guys. So this company is not kind of, kind of separatable from the real world, but it's kind of a network actually. And everybody, everything someone does or everything someone doesn't do will have some effect somewhere. So my role as a company owner would not be just to buy pre-products and sell them and sell as much as possible, but to kind of load all these interdependencies in my brain and try to negotiate and balance and, and care for everybody else as good as I can. And if I manage to do so, and everybody in this structure has no contract and could leave any time, then, in my opinion, I'm a successful entrepreneur and not about um, selling as much as possible. We even went that far to negotiate the costing structure with every stakeholder and every uh, end user in this collective, just to give you a general idea. The lowest part would be 6.6 .6 cents for the ingredients. 13.4 cents uh, goes to the bottling plant. 16.5 uh, will go to us, uh, sep separated in one cent per um, uh, climate uh, gas reduction, one cent for label, four cents for me, five cents for the speakers, for the end users, and so on. And this sums up to 36.5 cents at the bottling plant. Then the wholesaler would buy and sell to for 49 cents to the dealer. And the dealer and the wholesaler would sell for 60 cents to the gastronomy. And these rates all have been set and uh, decided upon in consensus with all the stakeholders. And this style of calculating it, instead of hectoliters, with the usual approach in, in the branch, will give you four main advantages, in my opinion. The first advantage is you will absolutely know exactly how the company's uh, vital data will look like every week because you could just use this, uh, this shares and put it in a so-called Excel from hell at our company. It's uh, 5 MB thick and we know per week actually how the company is running. Second aspect, if these rates are fixed, you will get uh, a kind of... Um, kind of more trust from your partners because they know how much share they will get from the sale of each bottle. And this results to the third uh, aspect. We have a very uh, low fluctuation. We lost 2% of the corporate users in 11 years of doing business, which is very, very low. And the fourth aspect, I personally find the most interesting one, is what's not in there. It's <coughs> profits. We just erased profits from this. Why? Usually, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I have, a, I have a, not a fixed rate, but a, a flexible rate. So I have an interest to press on the uh, suppliers and to raise the price from the customers and therefore widen my profits. And this is an interest I generally don't want to have in a company, especially not in my company. So we have a fixed rate, and this means I can only earn more money when I manage to care for more stakeholders and care for them so well they all deliberately stay because they want to and then as a result more bottles will be sold and then as a result I, have, I can make an income. And this is a very vital switch to the company in my opinion, not to care for profits but to care for a balance of all these shares. Just to give an idea how much control we thereby give away to the customers, we don't even select the, um, the outlets ourselves. Usually works that way that some guy, for example, in Lipsia asks, where can I buy a premium cooler here? And I might answer, sorry, there's no shop left right now, but you can care for it. You will get a, a kind of fact sheet, get samples and get, uh, get experienced uh, coach. And then you will go in your city to the dealers and to the gastronomists who understand the idea and convince them and collect like five uh, gastronomies. And with these five, we can find a dealer and with this dealer, we can find a wholesaler, so we kind of backwards build up a structure of two parts of delivery. And then we face the problem that, especially when the, in the beginning, the, so the transportation of small amounts is pretty expensive, so it's pretty hard uh, to, to build it up this way. And that's um, why we came up with a clever solution, in my opinion. It's so-called anti-volume discount. And this means we don't have a volume discount for a start because the big dealers don't need a double revenue. 
And furthermore, we have an anti-volume discount. Below four pallets, you can have a cheaper price, so the small dealer can make his entry. We have a relatively uh, a big amount of small dealers, which makes the whole company more stable. And we have a communications message, which is called anti-volume discount, uh, discount. These guys are crazy, but why do we still exist after 11 years? When all the bottles have been delivered, the account guy asks the wholesalers where had they delivered which amount. We pay their, sh their shares, and this whole structure looks, looks like this, a little bit chaotic, really. And uh, in 2008, we wrote this all down, like consensus democracy and anti-volume discount and collective, all these modules, and called it an operating system of a kind of, uh, kind of mental software which runs this whole structure, this whole company. And it easily fitted in the three areas of sustainability, plus two uh, aspects, which was called protection and transfer, what I'm doing now. And we kind of felt this, this is really too good to keep it to ourselves, so we gave it away for free and put it under a CC license up there. You can use it, rewrite it, remix it, share it further as you like. It just needs to be uh, said where it's come from and uh, has to maintain the same conditions. And my idea behind this was when we have managed to develop a style of doing business which is more social, more sustainable, more human than uh, others, we should give this away so others can take parts of it and maybe even develop their company in a similar way. And this kind of has worked out because this is the list of our corporation partners and brands. Quite an impressive list in my opinion. And on the left side are some other companies and brands who even um, offered us a share of their product for our organization of parts of their structure. So this kind of worked out and from a um, kind of end user sitting in my bathtub and uh, disliking the way Africola did business, I have become a kind of specialist for sustainable drinks organization, which wasn't planned, I have to admit. And this was just the fun part, and there's another fun part, um, not only of people who liked this, this idea and join it because they want to, but I also want to change other companies who don't like this idea so much. And one idea was, uh, as soon as we are producing a drink, which people fill in their bodies, we have a high res responsibility. So as, as soon as production mistakes occur, we have to publish them deliberately. And in my opinion, every drinks producer should do so. So we decided to promise this on the homepage. Anytime any production mistake might happen, we will, we will publish it actively. And my idea behind this was, we put, uh, we put up one million bottles per year, so there was two mistakes. And other producers might put uh, 50 million bottles and they don't publish mistakes, so I want you to ask them, are you really sure there has been no mistake? So I want to kind of use pressure of transparency on other companies who don't like the idea so much right now. And this goes further with uh, payment terms. For example, you will see here between 10 to 30 days the usual payment terms in the drinks industry and the usual customer would pay after two days, which is in the middle of this so-called frame of expectations. And then we have this Excel from hell and the exact tenth of cents per bottle calculation so we can pay after two days. And the receiver kind of learns, wow, there's not only possible to get my money after 10 days, but it can be uh, paid after two days. So the guy with 20 days does not look too good right now, and he's going to get asked, like Trinks, a big drink stealing company in Germany. It is the premium cola dwarf company. We have one promille marked market share. They can pay after two days. Why, can, why can't you? So I'm kind of indirectly getting on the nerves of other big companies who I don't even know. And this is the extra fun part. And with all these uh, strange ideas about doing business, one could say this is not scalable, this is not um, uh, transferable to others, and so on. But I'm sad to tell you this is our um, development. We have a growth rate of 30 to 50 percent per year, although we have nobody caring for this growth. So it's just driven by the, by the users. And this year we, is, we had to slow it down, to step on the brake, because otherwise the, the growth rate would have been too fast and we would have, um, we would have needed um, uh, to lend us money which also would have meant a certain switch in the company because when I lend money, I have to pay the rates and pay the interest and then I have an interest to sell. And I didn't want the switch, so we put on the brake and slow, slowed down the growth. 
And this is our distribution map, mostly Germany, 5% of German cities, a little Switzerland, a little uh, Austria. And by this, in my opinion, we have proven after 11 years of premium cooler that it's possible not to accept the current style of doing business as set and not to accept the books which say companies have to make profits and not to accept the general style of a CEO that he says where to go and everybody has to follow, but it's possible to work in this current capitalism and find, find a certain place and find a certain area and do things completely different. Anti-volume discount and consensus democracy, and totally strange, but it's possible to build a functioning structure of this. And we proved it after 11 years. And why did that work out? In my opinion, the internet is to blame because there has been a, uh, a power shift from companies to their users in the past, where I've learned it was quite common that the companies talked to, via the advertising agency to the customer, and the customer talked to the ma uh, market research to the, um, to the industry. And this is not going to work, because uh, nowadays the, the exchange, uh, the communications between the stakeholders is getting uh, more and more um, bigger and quicker. So companies and brands are not only what the responsible person wants them to be, but it's kind of becoming the sum of talks about it. And there will be talks, whether you like it or not. And furthermore, it's become very, very easy to fund your own company. You will find every law in the internet. You will find drinks company who's going to help you. You will find crowdfunding, crowd lending if you want, need to have money. So it's become quite unstable, quite dangerous environment for uh, regular companies. And uh, this needs different answers, in my opinion, how to run a business. In my opinion, businesses need to have a strict mission on the first hand. I can only give my uh, ours in German. It's called Premium will die Welt verbessern, indem wir ein menschliches und nachhaltiges Wirtschaftsmodell besser funktionierend und tragfähig vorleben und verbreiten. It's way too long, I know, but there's very much written into this. And this mission statement has to be lived up to consistently, and that's the second part, in this structure I draw for you. So everywhere you put your ear in this structure, to the dealing company, to the bottling plant, to the trucker, they all have to answer kind of like, oh yeah, they really do this. They're not, gonna, they're not only telling it, but they really do this. And how do, how do you get there, points number three and four? In my opinion, companies have to open up, share information, share mistakes in an open source style, and also um, give away back, like uh, op be open up for co-decisions of the relevant stakeholders and have a kind of co-development, dialogue development of brand and the company. And this means for sure that, that the fifth point, filters must be erased, like advertising agents for, uh, agencies, for example. They still can design and to program and so on, but the contents need to be coming from the company. And the only way of developing a company if the company and the brand is the sum of talks, is to talk. And this is the last uh, aspect. In my opinion, uh, you have to kind of feed these talks and set um, topics like vegan glue for labels, for example. Nobody had thought of this before, but we did it. We, we, uh, we made it, and then we can talk about it. And that's a way of kind of negotiating the brand and the company every day uh, again and again. And how can you do this? Actually, how can, you, how can you build up such a company? It's, it's not rocket science, I have to admit. It's just a combination of three aspects, which kind of like a general approach, one could say. First aspect would be have no clue. Be yourself, um, uh, make yourself clear that you don't have a clue. For example, after 11 years, I hopefully have uh, the, the best general idea and I hopefully have qualifications gained in moderation and so on, but I still need the information of every single stakeholder in this group. And if I don't get it, then I don't have a clue. So I have to be open for, uh, for every um, stakeholder's needs. And the second aspect would be stay stubborn. I, although I didn't have a really clear idea on where I, was, where I was about to go, I just had this feeling like I didn't, I don't like the usual business. I followed this like a train on, on tracks over years and years. It took me seven and a half years to even have a share per bottle and eight and a half years to make a living from it. But now I'm here and it's a dream come true, I have to tell you. And the, the last aspect would be to take advice even from idiots. We have some in our collective, and I'm not telling names, but some of them are really, they know everything better than me, and they're so clever people and so on. And sometimes they find a mistake, 
And I'm very, very thankful for them because they find a mistake nobody else does. And they get a very big ego for this, but it's fine. They find the mistakes. I'm happy that they did that. And this is not rocket science. This is just a kind of stepping back attitude, kind of. And you can do so too. It's not rocket science. So please go and hack business. Thank you for listening. So we have about 10 minutes time for questions until the next talk starts. <coughs> This was pretty fast for 20 minutes, yeah, right? <laughs> Lots of information. So um, you, you said there's a uh, sort of business model uh, up online that people can look at. So it seems a lot of the companies uh, that you mentioned that have kind of adopted a similar style, it, it, it's all drinks companies, isn't it? Most of them. Most of them. Uh, most of them are drinks companies, but we have one gastronomy from Nuremberg who adopted the concept, and we also have a toothbrush producer. Okay. And so the business plan is, or the, the what would you call it? Uh, I think it's suited for drinks production, but it's also possible to um, adopt to somewhere else. Um, uh, how do I explain it? I'm pretty happy uh, for. Um, with anybody just taking two or three modules of it because this will still make an improvement in my opinion. And there's, uh, the system has been developed with drinks production and drinks organization so it best suits there but it's possible to, um, to um, ex ex excel the, the, the core ideas somewhere else. For example, there's uh, three uh, further companies I kind of advise right now which are totally different uh, business models. One is from Bavaria, um, a huge um, uh, I don't know the word, a Baumittel producent. And uh, they also want to uh, develop their company somehow, so I'm, can be, maybe I'm able to help. Okay, thank you. Okay, over here. Um, I was just wondering, I see quite a bit, though not everything of course, but quite a bit of similarity to how open source uh, free software development works. We have direct interaction between producer and consumer and involve all the different uh, uh, stakeholders and so on. Did you have any uh, background uh, in that? Did you, did you participate in, in that community before? No. No, I get that question a lot, but this was all kind of freestyle. Okay, are there more questions? I would have one question here. Uh, I see the companies being compared to each other due to the growth and the sales volume. And that's the way they see the success of a company. And I see you premium so many in the network in other areas. Is there some idea already how to measure what is the impact of a company besides the sales? Sales would only cover one aspect of the company's development, that's true. Uh, this, there can be sales in numbers, there could be a decrease in my working time input, but with the same bottle numbers, which would also be a step forward. Uh, the, uh, I personally see the huge list of corporation and partners as a, um, as a growth also. This would be kind of like my 115th uh, talk. English is not my main language, but uh, these talks are kind of growth. and. Um, Personally, I don't have any way to measure this, but um, usually when I'm, when I'm talking at university um, surroundings, there's a so-called Führungsspanne, the ma maximum amount of people you could uh, reasonably uh, lead as, a, as a, a CEO. And this is usually like uh, nine people for direct leadership. And we managed to put up with 680, so it's kind of impossible what we do. And this also is a kind of, um, in my opinion, uh, a growth. But as I said, I'm not, um, not necessarily up to growth, so we even slowed it down this year, because um, if I prove that this concept is working, stable, then it's the basic proof. And if it's working so well that I can have talks about it and get covered in the media and uh, collect cooperation partners, then uh, other um, stakeholders might join and then more bottles will turn and more, <coughs> um, more effects will be made. But this is just uh, the result of the core idea to care for your stakeholders. And I think it's pretty uh, possible to just make a living by caring well for your stakeholders, and that's it. 
again, on the topic of caring for the stakeholders, um, we talked a lot about getting them closely involved in making all the decisions for the corporation um, and making everybody happy. Now, that doesn't sound like an easy thing to accomplish. How, how strictly are you able to adhere to that? I didn't quite, quite get the question. Oh, how strictly um, are you able to, to adhere to making all the stakeholders happy when you need to come to a decision as a business? Um, as with all open source structures I looked uh, at, there's, John, uh, there's one um, emergency exit, kind of. So if the company is um, blocking itself, I uh, am entitled to make a decision. And I have used this in 11 years for exactly two times. And these two times uh, concerned an art label on the insides of the bottles and one uh, text sentence of the outsides of the bottle. So every other issue, even the most complex calculations, uh, the firing of people also, we had to fire two people in 11 years. We were able to do all this in consensus. Can you just do simple majority rule or have to cover? Sorry? Can you just do simple majority rule? Oh no, it's consensus. So as long as uh, someone has any objection, there's no decision being made. So we have to talk as long as everybody, until everybody agrees. Okay, so as I don't see any raised hands anymore, uh, thank you for your presentation, both of you, or all you three. Uh, we will continue here in about five minutes with the people from Electrolab. Um, I don't know if they managed to set up their uh, booth at the exhibition area yet because we were missing some French plugs, I think, for the power. Uh, so in about five minutes, we are continuing here.